Happy Friday, everyone. Got a little bit of our change in routine since we were not in class on Wednesday. We're going to be uh, doing our case review. Hopefully, you didn't forget everything we talked about on Monday. Um, so uh, this is a, I, I actually really like this case. Um, this is an interesting case. It's a little bit dated. It uh, took place in, uh, um, I think it was 2013. Yeah, 2013. So it's a, a little over 10 years old. Um, some of the lessons are still irrelevant. Some of the things that they talk about are a little bit dated, but overall, I kind of like the way that it's approached and uh, the, the uh, flow of the case. Um, the cases that was given to you all, it was actually, I just copy and pasted it from the original case and tried to remove all the uh, ancillary details. If you've ever dealt with it like an actual true academic research case, it's it gets ridiculous after times because anytime there's a sentence, there has to be a reference. Remember in Capstone when you had to do your uh, your citations, okay? Uh, and you basically would do that like maybe one or two every paragraph, unless you were a really overachiever and you're just kind of like, I'm going to go all in on this, you know, but like one or two every paragraph. Uh, this one's like, you know, three or four citations for every sentence, and it got really, really tedious very quickly. So what I gave you all was uh, a, a version of that without all the information. All of it's relevant, but if you want to look back the original uh, original case, and the citation number, you can actually find that the link to where you can find that. But uh, this is over Target. Uh, and uh, about a big data breach they suffered at the end of 2013. Um, this is uh, one of those tangible examples. And I remember this taking place at the time. It was ironic because I was in the PhD program at Oklahoma State, and the PhD coordinator is a very interesting guy, uh, uh, but uh, he was talking about how he wanted Stillwater to get a Target, and that was his big selling point on getting people to come to uh, Join the program at uh, like, yeah we're gonna get a target really soon and he'd been saying that every single year since i started which i was in my third year of the program at that point and so uh yeah so that was kind of his selling point it's like yeah we're gonna be getting a target i still don't think stillwater actually has a target um but yeah we had uh we, we we were supposed to get it and target was supposed to be a big deal um and for those of you uh who have shopped at target you kind of noticed that it's it's, it's a big retailer they claim themselves as a competitor of Walmart. Um, there's definitely a different vibe there. Um, their prices are a little bit slightly higher, good, uh, but I, I would argue, and maybe disagree with me, and that's fine. Uh, I would say their quality is generally better. Their service is a little bit uh, stronger, which makes sense because Walmart prides itself on being a low cost provider. So when you have low cost, you basically get rid of the essentials like customer service and stuff like that. You know? Uh, you know, don't get me wrong. If you shop at Walmart, I, I certainly get that because they are they are the bottom barrel, um, and they they give you prices as cheap as they can be. But uh, there's there's definitely a loss in experience. And uh, I say Kirksville Walmart's a very interesting place to kind of float around but for a little while. You get, you get to see all the all the interesting aspects of Kirksville, Missouri when you go there. But we don't have a Target here, so we can't really you know, use a basis for comparison. Uh, different vibe, different kind of customer base that it, it, it brings in. Um, they had a big ad campaign several years back where they had the expect more, pay less. And they were trying to basically position themselves as an alternative. Interestingly, if you'd look up the uh, financials, uh, I looked them up right before class. Uh, Walmart is has about, uh, I want to say, a market cap of 600, uh, 650 billion, and uh, Target's market cap is 71 billion. So there's a pretty substantial difference in size. Uh, like a 10 to 1 size ratio. So even though uh, Target says, yeah, we're competing with Walmart, Walmart's kind of like, say, you're, you're, you're a mosquito that's on our arm or slapping. It's kind of how Walmart probably views it. Uh, particularly different scope. That being said, a uh, large organization by the standards at which we operate uh, definitely can uh, be one of those corporations that we talk about. We're concerned with their operations. And uh, this, is a, this is a case a little bit about their cybersecurity incident that happened, the notorious data breach that we've talked, we've talked about. So uh, let's just talk a little bit of background about uh, Walmart before we kind of Walmart target. I'm already there, I'm already transposing it to. So a little bit of background about target before we get into the details of the questions of the case. So um, in the case, it talks about how they started up uh, in a place called Roseville, Minnesota, Roseville, Minnesota. And uh, I have never heard of Roseville, Minnesota. Has anybody ever visited there? I not too terribly familiar. Um, I, I say that that's like a random place to start, but then again, tar, or Walmart started in Bentonville, Arkansas, which is also a very random place. Uh, but uh, yeah, they started out there in 1962, so they're like, what, uh, a little over 60 years old. And they were considered to be the second largest discount retail in the United States behind Walmart. Uh, I think that's actually changed now. I think there's some 
discount retailers. It really depends on how you classify. So I believe Costco is now considered to be the second largest, uh, but I don't know if they're considered to be retailer or if they're considered but they're substantially larger target in terms of volume. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, as far as uh, the nature goes, it talks a little bit about uh, their, their, their infrastructure in place. So this is an interesting discussion about uh, what uh, target had in place. And, and there's some, some back and forth about this within the case that we're going to discuss. Uh, but it talks a little bit about uh, their environment. And they said they were following best practices. Uh, at the time, and uh, they met uh, payment card industry standards, which uh, that's going to be a question about whether or not those standards were appropriate for the situation that we encountered. Uh, they actually had developed a malware detection tool for, uh, uh, or sorry, implemented a uh, malware detection tool for 1.6 million, uh, developed by the cybersecurity company FireEye. And uh, they actually had a, a standalone security operations center uh, with personnel in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Bangalore. Um, so they had some outsourcing going on as well. Um, they, it appears that basically this is the last sentence kind of tells you the characteristics of the case before we move in. Appeared to be following industry best practices and reasonable security controls in place. So this is kind of a differentiation to what your expectation is. is there's a cybersecurity, there's a data breach, cybersecurity incident. Um, obviously there were lax, and I think we're going to identify this in lax uh, approaches here in just a little bit. But for the most part, I think we'd say this, this is a, they were a good organization with respect to the controls they had in place. They appeared to be taking these threats seriously and to doing, doing their job to, to at least to some degree, uh, at least to be considering this particular aspect of the uh, issue. About then, uh, November 30th, 2013, what happened? Uh, the uh, center in Bangalore said, hey, uh, we got a blip on our radar. And uh, Target said, oh, well, let's just go ahead and move in. Let's take care of this right away. Isn't that what happened? No, they said, November 30th, they said, hey, uh, something happened. It's probably just an accident. Let's ignore it. Let's not ignore it. Then something happened again on December 2nd, and then again, take no action. And then it wasn't until December 12th when the Department of Justice said, hey, you guys have been hacked, okay? There is malware on your system. So full two weeks after the initial incident, uh, they find out about this. And so uh, they basically figured out, uh, yeah, something is problematic. Uh, there was a, there was an incident that was not addressed, or a second incident that was not adequately addressed. And it wasn't until an outside source came in and said, "Yep, we've got a problem, and you guys need to address this." So, to Target's credit, uh, they immediately uh, answered the problem and they immediately disclosed this information. Right? You gotta always be wary when I say right, okay? Because you know that I'm setting you up for a fall. It's like it's a trap. It's a trap. You know, so sometimes when I say right, it'll be correct, but this is not right. So basically they said, we're going to gather information before we disclose any details. This is around, uh, I think, December 15th. This is when the CEO was saying that's day one when we, uh, I would start taking things seriously. So December 15th, they start working and they start gathering information December 16th. And then something very profound that was not in the questions in the case, but something very profound happened on December 18th. Did anybody catch that? What kind of drove this whole process? So there was a cybersecurity professional who was also a blogger, okay? Uh, I'm by Blake Kim's name, I was just thinking about it a little while ago. Brian Krebs, yeah, Brian Krebs, whose uh, name actually comes up a lot around this time period. He was the one who actually uh, disclosed the uh, Home Depot uh, data breach that occurred a year later. But on his blog, he said, hey, customer is a target, you probably should know. Uh, the US Department of Justice identified a massive data breach that occurred at Target, and your, your information may have been exposed. So this was not Target that disclosed this information initially. This was a blogger, got a lot of media traction. And so immediately after that, Target said, yes, what you've heard is correct. There was a data breach. Yeah, sorry, I didn't tell you, mm, whatever. Uh, but uh, they started talking about the procedures that were in place and uh, then they started talking about their actions. And so that's where we're at. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about kind of the in implications of that and uh, some of the approaches that Target took and as to whether or not these were appropriate or not. And uh, the, the reason this is interesting is because there's multiple respects you can take as a pro with respect to this as to why Target did what they did. So let's go ahead and start with question number three. Case indicates that Target's investigation did not begin until after contact with the Department of Justice, just like we talked about. Was Target negligent in not proactively investigating the initial incident in uh, November 30th, 2013, or the second incident, December 2nd, 2013? And uh, you know what? I, I got to be honest here. I generally don't like giving uh, giving Dylan easy questions, but I'm going to give you an easy question. Okay, what do you what did your group say on this one? 
Um, we said that, although, or that they were alerted that the response like was talked about, and the DOJ contacted them and chose not to investigate. Um, and by not investigating their breach um, on their own accord, they were negligent for the risk they were putting their customers in. Right. So it doesn't appear that they really took the threat seriously. Now, could some of this be attributed to the fact that uh, they probably didn't think there was a threat? I mean, we just talked about the uh, protocols and the infrastructure they had in place, and they seem to be pretty good protocols and infrastructure. And so imagine if you, if you, uh, I mean, let's kind of uh, use a, an example. This is just off the top of my head, so I apologize for not having one ready. But let's say you just put a whole bunch of work into your car, all right? You got it tuned up, you just took it to the shop, you made sure that everything was good, your oil changed, your tires rotated. You wanted to check over uh, everything in your vehicle, make sure it was running well. And you spend a whole bunch of money in doing that. Then you drive it off and you start hearing noises coming from your engine. It's like, okay, that's got to be, that, that can't be anything because they just fixed my car and made sure it was running perfectly. There can't be a problem going on here. That's kind of what I would assume is probably the approach that Target's taking. It's like, yeah, that's just, that's, that's something else. Like maybe a squirrel ran into the car and it ran over it or something like that. That's a gruesome thought, but I actually was worried about running over a squirrel on my way to campus. That's why I, that's, that's horrid on my mind. So yeah. That's uh, that's kind of uh, their approach, and uh, they they probably were negligent in the fact they said this can't be an issue. We've got too strong a system in place for that to be an issue. So I think that there's a very easy argument that there was negligence here. Uh, justified negligence? What do you guys think? Could, could could you justify it in that situation? Maybe if you really think their infrastructure is as strong as they say it is, we're going to find out it's probably not as strong as the, as Target thinks. There, there's probably some lax issues. So. Target did not report the data breach until, you know, until nearly three weeks after the first detection of suspicious activity. Should organizations that are responsible for confidential client information have responsibility to develop or to disclose uh, cybersecurity incidents in a timely manner? Okay, um, this is another pretty easy, easy question, but it's not. It's a deceptive. Okay, what do you think, Kyle? What did your group say? Um, whether it's disclosure or not is dependent on the character of the actual breach. So while companies should be responsible for timely disclosure, that looks different. For so did, did you just give me an it depends? <laughs> yeah. I am so proud right now. So proud. Yeah. It really, it really does depend. Okay. It really does depend on the characteristics of the situation. And so let's talk a little bit about those characteristics because there's some questions that I followed up with. So what are some arguments to support timely disclosure? And uh, you know what? I, I was going to pick on you next, Kyle, but you gave me an it depends, and I'm so happy with that that uh, I'm going to actually go to Kirsten on this one. So. Here's to what's your group say on this one? I, or we said like the quicker they can announce it to everybody, the more uh, like damage control, like quicker that customers that are affected can try and do on their own. Right. So so if you if you move quickly, then you can minimize the impact of the problem. Okay, minimize the effect of the problem. So moving quickly I can actually uh, uh, stop any issues, further issues from happening. Won't well, stop the issues that already happened but may prevent anything further from happening. So that's definitely a, a, a consideration. Let's also consider us about other perspectives, okay? Would we say that uh, Target has a responsibility to its stakeholders? Do they have an obligation to their stakeholders to disclose this information? I think so. No, when we, we say stakeholders, are we specifically talking about stockholders or the shareholders of the company? No, who was probably, who's probably the primary stakeholder in this particular situation? The customer, Target's customers, okay? The stakeholders, the customers are definitely going to want to know about this as it will affect their operational decisions. So I think there are responsibility stakeholders. Are there other stakeholders here other than uh, customers? Could there be entities that Target uh, does operations with or, or works in operations? Keep in mind that we're about to find out Target was not the source of the cyber attack. It was actually one of their vendors. So could it possibly be that Target doing work business with other vendors, they could be compromised by the same issue, attack, the same issue? Yeah. Target's kind of the focus of this, but Target was not the uh, inception of this, all right? They were not the ones who were originally attacked. Uh, also, um, there's a, an important, important concept in accounting that we talk about, particularly in auditing, it begins with the letter T, okay, that we should always strive for in accounting, okay? This concept of making sure everything is clear as possible, and clear is the, the, the operative term there. What is that term I'm referring to? Transparency, very good, transparency. And in order to be able to have enough transparency, there has to be disclosure. You can't have transparency with that disclosure and unless, unless you're just willing to open every operation up and say, you know what, we're going to be fully transparent. You can come walk through our operation center and see everything that we're doing, and you can access our computers anytime. 
that probably is not a good idea. So transparency is kind of initiated through the disclosure of information along those lines. So yeah, that was a, I think there's, there, there's a pretty strong argument for the need to have uh, the disclosure of incidents in a timely manner. But obviously, because I'm, I'm a big advocate of the soy logoi, I decided to have you all argue against it as well. So uh, let's go ahead and talk about that. What are some arguments to uh, support a more cautious approach? Um, Jordan, what's your group say on this one? You said that like if you wait, you'll have more information to give your stakeholders and the customers. Like you'll be able to tell them what exactly was affected with their information. Exactly. So uh, it, disclosure is important, but can we argue that better and full disclosure is going to be more important than minimal disclosure? Yeah, I think that's the point that Jordan's trying to make is that uh, if you have more information, you can provide more detail. So waiting and investigating the problem will allow them to provide more robust disclosure and provide more or more detail. It's really, really problematic if somebody asks, what's the scope of this breach? And say, I don't know, which is going to relate to something else that we're going to talk about here in just a second. But uh, also, do we want to make sure there's actually a problem? Probably so, okay. In this situation, we weren't certain, certain uh, to what degree there's a problem. Obviously, when the Department of Justice says there's a malware attack, uh, that's probably a pretty big signal that there is a problem. But on November 30th and December 2nd, we're not really certain. So that investigation is probably really important. Now, that are, there's the arguable point that they actually investigate those incidents is they pass them off as nothing. And that's not really clear again, based on the context of the case. You would assume that there was some follow-up but it seems like they probably didn't treat them as seriously as they should have. An interesting aspect, this actually has to do with uh, something that's uh, pro common in financial research, okay? Um, let's assume that Target disclosed this attack. They, uh, December 15th, okay, they found out about it. They don't have all the details. They found out about it, and they immediately go to press and say, all right, there has been a cyber attack at Target, and there's been a data breach. We are not exactly sure as to the extent of the attack. What will people naturally assume when they hear that statement? Will they assume best case scenario or worst case scenario? Worst case scenario, when, it, when given incomplete information, people naturally assume worst case scenario. This is a concept called signaling theory, is that if you do not provide clear signals to people of what the uh, status of the situation is, then they're going to assume the worst possible scenario. They're gonna assume the worst possible situation. So. How many, how many uh, credit cards were, were exposed in the attack? We don't know. Oh, so you mean all of them, okay? All of them, including for people who didn't work at shop at Target, which that was actually an interesting point in the case that I don't think I covered in the uh, questions, that uh, Target actually sent out their correspondence and they said, hey, we've got some remediation efforts available to you if you want to uh, do this is for, for, for being a customer at Target. A lot of people on that list weren't actually customers at Target, so where did they get that list, okay? And uh, yeah, that's that's kind of some interesting issues too. That would probably shake my confidence of, of, in their security if I was like, I've never shopped at Target, and all of a sudden they're saying my credit card data has been breached. Hmm, this is weird. Uh, the, the interesting thing about that is, is I think that the arguments that they had, the long-term argument behind that was that our, uh, Target had some business partnerships with or companies like Amazon uh, that they think that uh, that that was a mailing list from that entire. Uh, partnership as opposed to just people who are tar customers solely at Target. And I believe that was the original argument is why that uh, people on the mailing list who never shopped at Target were included on that communication. But I'm getting past myself. Okay. So yeah, we have people naturally assuming the worst, which is not a good scenario. Okay. You don't want people having naturally the worst. Has anybody ever done that, by the way, received incomplete information and just naturally assumed the doomsday scenario? Anybody in this classroom? Everybody is like, everybody's like, yeah, I'm just very positive, Dr. Barnes. I never assume, I didn't assume bad things, you know, I, 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 I assume that if I missed a question on the exam, that was the only question that I missed on the exam. I didn't miss any other questions. It's like 96 out of 100. Yeah. I know Tribune students well too well. You know, everybody was nodding. They were saying, yeah, I do that all the time. Yeah, I'm doing that all the time. Yeah. So you can kind of relate to that kind of concept. All right. The case indicates the data breach originated. Oh, come on. Okay. Case indicates the data breach uh, originated with one of Target's vendors that had access to Target system. So this is actually Fazio Mechanical Services, and that was where the data breach started. It was within their subsystems. Um, and remember, they said uh, a little bit about Fazio, that uh, Fazio was a contractor that provided, I think it was uh, cooling and refrigeration services. I don't remember what the exact quote was, but something along those lines. And they had uh, access to Target systems for electronic billing and uh, uh, other related uh, transaction abilities within the target system. So they're basically a service provider. 
So it would fall under the scope of uh, service system and organization controls, uh, which is what we're going to talk about here in just a second. But uh, they looked at uh, Fazio, and Fazio said, yeah, we are following all the best practices. We have definitely got a malware service on our system. Okay. What was the deal with their malware, their malware software? Is their malware software top of the line, uh, you know, top approach? No, uh, it was the free version, free version, which, by the way, if you have the free version of a malware detection service, that's fine. Okay. Because you yourself are not a corporation dealing with another multi million dollar corporation that's subject to cyber attacks. Okay. So if you want to download malware bytes and see if there's no malware, uh, malware on your computer, that's great. Okay. You probably can get by with the free software. Probably not a good idea for a big organization dealing with a much bigger organization. Now, this is something that we're kind of going to be talking about because this is uh, relates to what we what discussed with uh, system and organization controls. So, how does this revelation relate to our discussion of system organization controls from reporting from two weeks ago? Was it two weeks ago? I didn't do the math. Okay, we got on here. I think it may have been longer than two weeks ago. However many weeks ago we talked about it, uh, whatever the week period uh, period of time was. Um, how does that relate? Uh, oops, there's an up next. Oh, Jason, you're up next. What'd your group say? Um, he said this highlights the importance of SOC reports, particularly SOC 2. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> standard, definitely standard. So importance of importance of SOC reports, particularly SOC 2, because remember SOC 2 we talked about has to deal with trust services. So opera, uh, uh, offerings of operational and compliance uh, services to an organization, which I'd say would definitely fall in the scope here. Now, if uh, it, it sure sounds like that they are some limited scope and provision here. So just based on the characteristics and the factors here, assuming that a SOC report was issued, which I don't know that it was, okay, but assuming the SOC report is issued, do we think it was probably a type one report or a type two report here? I would say based on the fact that they had no malware, uh, they had no, no updated malware services, malware provider, that it was probably a type one report. Because again, they made the claim that they were in compliance with best practices, but a, SOC, a SOC two type two report would have identified, yeah, that's, that's great. They say that they've got the, the controls that are properly designed, but the ones that they have in place are not going to be effective. They're not going to be effective. Because remember, type one says, we look at the design of the controls. Type two says, we look at both the design and the operating effectiveness. And we can say that there was some serious issues with operating effectiveness. Now, again, that's assuming that there was a SOC report issued. It's entirely possible the target thought this was such a small scale contributor that they did not have, uh, they did not even need a SOC report. Uh, that's probably something I should investigate given the number of years that I've worked on this case. I'm not even sure that the information is available. But yeah, it highlights the importance of having these particular pieces of information because the integration of this not comprises the control system or compromises the control system in place of Target. Target itself was not the source of the attack. It was one of their vendors, one of their service providers that was integrated with their system because they had access to the, uh, the, uh, the Target backend then any information or any uh, compromises that occurred uh, within Fazio's system could also be relayed to the target system. And that's in fact what happened. So they got access to the system. They managed to actually access the point of sale uh, point of sale terminal, and uh, they actually accessed credit card information. And one of the things that was uh, discovered is that Target was in compliance with PCI standards at the time, payment card industry standards at the time. Payment card industry standards said when credit card information is transmitted, it has to be encrypted. Now, remember that was a big that was a big problem in our TJX case we talked about. They were transmitting raw credit card information over an unsecured wireless terminal and somebody just said, hijack that signal, get all that information. So Target was actually meeting that standard. They were transmitting information or they're transmitting information securely. The problem is, is when they were storing information prior to transmission upon this uh, point of sale systems themselves. What was the deal with that? Was it secure? Was the, were they encrypted on the point of sale system? Trick questions. Yes. No, it's not a trick question. No, that was not. They were not encrypted. The credit card information was not actually encrypted at the point of sale. So you ran your credit card through. Your credit card number sat on the uh, this cash register system or the point of sale terminal, whatever you want to call it. Okay, just sat there in its raw, unencrypted form. And then when it was supposed to be transmitted to the credit card company later in the day, that's when they would encrypt it for transmission. But if somebody has access to that point of sale system, if they can actually hack, the, hack that, which is what happened here, 
they can read the unencrypted information, the unencrypted detail. And so that was certainly problematic. That was certainly problematic. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So they actually started talking about, uh, um, start talking a little bit about this in uh, question number six, about targets issues themselves. Sorry, I got distracted because I'm trying to make sure I read everything. Uh, I think we covered question five legitimately. So let's talk about question six. So in addition to the Horman issue with the targets vendor, the investigation team noted rampant issues in targets IT infrastructure or some of these issues. So, all right, I uh, already dealt with one, okay? Access to the point of sale terminal. If you got access to that point of the system, then uh, basically you could actually have access to the raw the raw credit card data. You didn't need to train, I mean, unencrypt the data. You didn't have to go with any hoops. You just got all the details. It also said that there, if the other information was also provided through the point of sale system, not just the credit card information, but the user information, address, phone number, other personal details were actually captured in that system because a lot of these credit cards carried that information because I'm assuming a lot of them were probably target credit cards. So uh, that certainly a problem, a problem in there, major problem, major hurdle and obstacle. Um, also, how about access to the point of sale system, okay? Uh, was there something that talked about being able to access point of sale, not necessarily through the directly through the point of sale itself? Like, did somebody need to walk up to the credit card, or to the, the point of sale system and actually access it directly, or could they access it through other means? Uh, I'm obviously leading to a specific conclusion. Brock, what would you, what, actually, sorry, we'll do Maddie first. Maddie, uh, what's your group identifying this one? They said that their POS system was accessible from a deli counter scale. Yeah. Boy, that's 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 a, that's a real blow right there. It's like, okay, we're a secure system. It's like, well, I just wait some deli meat and then I got credit card number information. So, uh, yeah, you're not that, that secure. Probably weren't waiting deli meat, but uh, still. Accessing a point of sale system in one store from a deli scale in another store, That's that seems to be a big uh, security lapse right there. And so... Certainly accessing, uh, being able to access, like in a widespread network, first of all, you would assume that the breaches should be contained within a particular uh, within a particular location. Like if you access a point of sale system by another means, it should be isolated to that particular location, like one one daily, daily scale that's in the same store. But accessing a completely different uh, store's point of sale system, that's a pretty big, uh, pretty big problem. In the past, I've actually said that this was part of the fraud. This was actually what the uh, the uh, investigator did. Uh, Verizon actually went in and they actually managed to hack into uh, Target's point of sale system from the Delhi scale. So that was certainly problematic. Uh, any other interesting things that were identified here, uh, Brock? What did your group identify? Hmm. They had a lack. Basically, just poor passwords, weak passwords, over 500,000 weak passwords. Mm -hmm. So, okay, go ahead. Unless you want to. No, go ahead. They're missing some critical Microsoft patches and they're running outdated software. Yeah, more on just passwords. Yeah. So, <laughs> weak passwords. And they actually talked about it in a couple of different contexts. First of all, uh, they talked about uh, the nature of the passwords uh, being just weak in, in, in context. I'm going to try to see if I can find this on there. I, so I wanted to look for it last year, but uh, there was actually, yeah. So uh, this is an interesting uh, uh, diagram. It talks about how long it takes a hacker to brute force your password. All right. And this is kind of a, a little bit, of, basically, uh, you want to have probably at least 10 characters in your password, and it needs to be a combination of uh, numbers, uppercase, lowercase letters, and symbols. If you have four characters as a password, it does not matter what combination it is, a, a hacker can brute force your password instantaneously. Uh, if you have uh, eight characters, then uh, even if you have a mixture of those, they take about eight hours. Pretty much uh, the where you want to be is you want to be in the number of characters. Like you get to like uh, 18 characters with a combination of numbers and upper, lowercase symbols. Uh, it says seven quadrillion years, which is a long time. Okay, so it means that it probably will never be cracked. Uh, it would be you have to be very very lucky in that. So I think this is kind of an interesting diagram, and this is this is an interesting context for the uh, target case because a lot of default uh, passwords were left in place, which is very easy to guess a default password, especially if everybody has the same default password. Um, even so, the passwords that were used were not particularly outstanding. They were maybe in one word and uh, they're very, very short number of letters. 
So like your last name or something like that, which is generally, by the way, if anybody's password is their last name, please change it, okay? Change it now. You can ignore what I'm saying for the rest of the lecture. Change your password now, all right? I would rather have you avo avoid having your information hacked than, uh, than listen to what I'm talking about, okay? Now, if you have good secure passwords, you do have to listen to me, okay? It's a penalty for good behavior. But, uh, that being said, kind of an interesting diagram with respect to here. Uh, I'm gonna talk about how cyber secure criminals can access this. And this has been true for a while. I think uh, probably newer tools probably will change this, but uh, I, I kind of want to be like Dr. Caden, and I don't mean the fact that I want to be a tax professor. That's not what I'm discussing. But if you've ever seen Dr. Caden type in her password, she usually just types in like a novel for her password. And uh, yeah, I, I would assume it's a novel that nobody can read because it's probably a combination of letters, numbers, and upper, upper and lowercase characters and symbols. So uh, yeah, uh, interesting information there. But uh, yeah, with respect to the passwords, certainly a lot of problems with that. Uh, they said that uh, the Verizon team was able to compromise or to crack 500,000 passwords, which comp or comprised 86% uh, of all accounts at Target. So 86% of the accounts in Target were insecure, it could be, uh, could be uh, hacked into, which uh, does not give me a lot of confidence. Then as Brock alluded to, uh, there was a lack of regular maintenance and patching going on with the programs and the, uh, the, uh, the protection uh, that was in place in their systems. And this is an interesting point, okay? Why does this stuff like this happen? And the answer is, is that mostly because people do not really follow the protocols they're supposed to be uh, meeting. Uh, this happens, I, I would suspect this is probably a big reason why the cyber attack occurred at Truman a few years back is because people were not following best practices with respect to updating their machines and their systems and the prop, uh, necessary software and hardware, necessary software and patching was in place. Now, uh, I, you hear me joke about a lot of the time, I'll talk about how, uh, how difficult it is sometimes for my computer to operate because I'll get, I'll get onto it, try to work on something when the updates and the, the patches are being installed. And it's really, really frustrating. I, I like had one point uh, last week where I was trying to get on a Zoom call and the Zoom call took like five minutes to connect because it was running an update right at the same time as I trying to Zoom call. But I will say I, I use probably more than a few expletives when things like that happen. Uh, at least in my mind, maybe I don't letter them out loud. Uh, that, that, that may change in the future, who knows? But uh, yeah, uh, I do still think it's important and it's it's really, really critical to have these updates and Truman State has basically said, we don't really trust the faculty to run their own updates. We're gonna run those updates mandatory for them. And I've gotta say, God bless Truman State IT for that because I'll tell you right now, even the ones who know how important it is are probably gonna be negligent and those who don't understand the importance will definitely be negligent. So that's one of the reasons I will I will accept a, a little bit of swearing and cursing and running behind on my tasks in order to make sure that uh, my personal information does not get hacked. And that's that's the goal here. By the way, uh, if you do remember the cyber attack, which I'm sure some of you do, uh, it, I guess it was like not even two years ago, it was like a year and a half ago. And so, uh, yeah, the cyber attack, Truman State actually did a really nice job with that. It, it seemed like we, we were kind of running around with the chickens with the head cut off. But given how a lot of organizations deal with ransomware, Truman actually had a plan in place and they followed that plan. It took a long while to get them back up and running. I do remember uh, summer of 2023 when I was having to do answer all of my emails over Gmail and that, that sucked, okay? Uh, not that the Gmail client was bad, but because uh, all of my stuff was stored on Microsoft Outlook. So if they were referring to a previous conversation, I'd have to open up Microsoft Outlook, look up the original conversation, then open up Gmail and then have to transpose the conversation from one client to another, which is miserable, by the way. It's, it's one of the reasons why I think it's nice to have that secure client set up now with all the information. But certainly uh, it was inconvenient, but it was ended up being a good, uh, a good lesson for us. And uh, we have better security moving forward. Yeah. I'm saying that. Hopefully I've not cursed it. Hopefully I've not jinxed, jinxed things. All right. Question number seven. Chase notes that Target incurred substantial costs, both quantifiable and non-quantifiable, as a result of the breach. All right, so they did talk about the specific direct cost associated with the uh, actions themselves. I think they said they had to spend two hundred million dollars on uh, protection and updates, and they provided uh, um, mod credit monitoring services for all the credit card uh, users who were affected in that situation, and so uh, some very specific costs in there as well as updating their system and making sure that the protocols are correct and the, the system itself was uh, updated as necessary. So those are, uh, those are uh, quantifiable. I think some non-quantifiable costs, and maybe I'm not using the term correctly, it's probably not quantifiable, but indirect costs. Um, 
the revenues that they lost as a result of the disclosure. Because this did occur around Christmas time, and I bet a lot of people are saying, I'm going to go shop at Target. It's like, I'm going to go shop at Walmart or, or someplace else. Um, they ended up losing, I think during that period, they ended up losing 1% of their revenues, of their total revenue from the previous period, which was like 34% of net profits of sales were down from the, the previous year, which that's pretty substantial. Uh, if I took a 34% cut in my net net re, or my net income, I I would probably not be able to eat cheeseburgers as frequently as I want to. So yeah, that's a, a pretty sig significant and serious blow to them. And so, uh, yeah, um, so the question then becomes, if we talk about uh, quantifiable versus not quantifiable costs, uh, it, what, is, what does this observation indicate about the relative benefits of strong cybersecurity infrastructure, which are preventative, versus the remediation of cybersecurity as it's detective or corrective, all right? And uh, Dylan, this one's a lot more challenging, so I'm gonna throw back to you, because I gave you an easy one earlier. Uh, so our group said that spending large sums of money on preventative controls are likely to end up being less costly than not having the control and then spending that money on detective and corrective action. Um, as if preventive controls can help avoid non-quantifiable damage, such as reputation loss, health, customer trust. So can we argue that preventative controls in all likelihood are going to be less costly than remediation of an incident after the fact? I think every single person in this room would agree with that statement, okay? The problem with that is it's very, very difficult to quantify what the effects of that are. We can see the cost, but we can't necessarily see the benefits. Now, I've got a silly example, and uh, this, is, this is always subject to argument. It's subject to what the perspective is. <laughs> but let's say that uh, we've got uh, four students in this class, and I'm not going to mention any names. We're just going to say four different students, okay? And you're all studying for the same exam. One student studies 20 hours, really, really serious about doing well in the exam, okay? Another student studies 10 hours, half as much, but still pretty serious about the exam. Another student studies four hours, and another student doesn't study at all, okay? Now, these are kind of preventive mechanisms, and we can argue that we probably think the student who, uh, who studied 20 hours is probably going to say, probably perform well and have the greatest security there. They're gonna have the greatest uh, reassurance. And uh, some may even argue that that student who studied 20 hours, that was too much. That was probably a little bit too over overboard, but they're just being reassured. And the student who studied zero is probably in for a real, real bad scenario, bad problem, okay? But what happens then if all four get their exams back and assuming that there's full disclosure of grades, which uh, I don't think happens, but it's full disclosure of grades, all four students got the same exact grade. How would that affect your interpretation of that? Would you say, well, you know what? Uh, it, it would, first of all, it would probably depend on what the grade is, okay? If it was a good grade, then the person who probably studied 20 hours says, I may have studied more than everybody else, but I'm happy with my grade. Right. But if it was a bad grade and you're saying, OK, that was way too much work. I should have just studied no hours. It's a waste of time. Basically, the point I'm trying to get at is that if we don't really judge the action. We judge the result. And that's kind of how we used to evaluate cost. The problem being is that some results are not quantifiable. They're not. We can't actually look at those results and judge what happens. If something bad happens, then we say we needed to do more. If something good happens if nothing or nothing bad happens, then we assume that regardless of whatever we did, it was sufficient. And that's not the right approach to take. That's not especially uh, effective, particularly if we know that there are consequences down the line that we need to address and we're not addressing them. And I think that's one of the real problems that we face is that not being able to quantify what the benefits are in a particular scenario really, really impedes progress in this area, which is a spoiler for the final question, because the lesson learned section, the case notes that the incident forced Target to reevaluate its existing infrastructure and updated systems and processes accordingly. Based on a proven target and other retailers that have taken this incident object lesson, can it be argued that data breach results in net positive benefit? So I want to take this question in two parts, okay? I want to think about target, and then I want to think about other retailers, all right? So Kyle, I know the group probably didn't answer this question specifically. It's probably a conglomeration of an answer, but what would you think if your group were to answer this question just for target alone? Do we think it was a net positive benefit? You would say no. No, what was your argument on that? that it shouldn't take a bad data breach for target to be able to I, I would agree with that statement, okay? So net positive benefit is really, really bad to argue when something <laughs> bad happened to make something good happen. I think we can argue that the, the, the end result was probably a good thing, but we're just, the focus on the bad things in advance is are problematic. Now, some of you may have come up with a different conclusion saying, well, it looks like it ended up with a net positive result in the future. If you look at Target's operations in this current year, you may argue against it, considering they're struggling, this is what I read in the news. But uh, yeah, 
Uh, that one's subject to interpretation for sure. Uh, I do think that uh, there's a very, very clear argument for saying no, uh, although that's not a not a absolute uh, straightforward 100% correct argument. It is subjective. A little bit less objective is the next question. What about the other retailers? All right, so Kirsten, what would your group say if I was to say not Target, but everybody else? They get to see like the mistakes tar Target made or like maybe learn from their, learn from what they did so they can strengthen their own system. Sorry. So if they learn from them, then it was a net positive benefit, right? Yeah. Okay, so great. So no more data breaches, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not the case. Like a year later, Home Depot suffered a much larger, or not, not much larger, a slightly larger data breach because Target's was like 40, 40 million credit card numbers. Home Depot's was like 50 million credit card numbers. Uh, and if we're just talking about retailers, there have been a lot of retailers who've had data breaches, maybe not the same size and scope. Can there be other organizations that should take this uh, incident under advisement as well? Not just retailers, but uh, type, type service organizations. Like, uh, let's see, uh, there's, a, there's another example of a retailer, Alibaba. Have you heard of Alibaba? Okay. They're like a Chinese-based firm, but they're very similar to Amazon and operations. They had a pretty large data breach back in uh, 2022. Anybody know how many accounts were affected on that one? It's probably, you're going to say, well, it's probably larger than 40 million if you're talking about large data breach. It was slightly larger than 40 million. It was 1 billion. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Alibaba, re very recently. Uh, and then uh, Facebook. Uh, Facebook has had a few data breaches, like when I say few, one every year since 2018. Okay. So yeah, some pretty significant data breaches. But you're probably arguing, you know what, we're a new generation, Dr. Barnes. We're not like your old bogeys that still operate on Facebook. We just do LinkedIn. And it's good you should be on LinkedIn, okay, because you want to actually develop your brand. You want to develop your, develop your image. That was actually what they were talking about in the professional, uh, the professional interaction, the uh, True is formal Wednesday, developing your brand and going on LinkedIn and promoting and marketing yourself. So LinkedIn, okay, you don't have to worry about that because LinkedIn's never had a data breach, right? Everybody's like waiting for it. When's the boot going to drop? Uh, uh, LinkedIn, 2012, 2021. Oh, and recently, 2024. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah, three different data breaches uh, over the past 12 years. So uh, certainly some problems. Yeah, which kind of really causes a problem. So like, these are networking tools. We're a little bit concerned about the accuracy of information. Fortunately, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. I don't put anything up there that people don't already know. Okay, so uh, just yeah, make sure it's all, all stuff that I'm willing really to share with the public. So again, should this have been a net benefit for everyone? Yes. Was it? Probably not. People did not take these lessons very seriously, and that's just again human nature. We tend to wait until the results of something happens to react instead of being proactive. Which if I could teach anybody in this class to be do, do anything, it's like be proactive and stuff like this. Don't be reactive because trying to address this problem after the fact is a much bigger chore. I think the Truman State data breach is a good example of that. And this is going to become more and more prominent over the future. We're going to see a lot more issues. Data breaches will continue to occur. We're starting to see new, uh, new types of cybersecurity attacks. Uh, the one we talked about last week, ransomware. Ransomware is becoming increasingly prominent, and it's, uh, I think it's only going to become more so as uh, computers become more open-ended, the tools become more advanced. One that really scares the heck out of me is something called Killware. Has anybody heard about this? So it's basically ransomware without the ransom. Somebody just basically wants to create chaos. And uh, the reason it's called Killware is the first reported incident of this, uh, oh, using a, a cyber or, or computerized tools. I believe it was 2020. It was a, a, a water treatment facility in Florida. There was a disgruntled employee who basically was just upset with his uh, his boss's decision to fire him. So had still had access to the system, got in and started adding chemicals to the water that would have killed a whole lot of people had the water supply been re, uh, let let out. Uh, so fortunately, somebody was on the top of it and actually said, "Yeah, this should not be happening," and managed to prevent the water from actually being flow or being released into the public distribution. But yeah. That's certainly problematic. That's really worrisome for me is when people start acting like that. They're not even looking for a ransom. They're looking for something just to create chaos, to create pandemonium. The worry, the worry that really uh, makes me, keeps me up at night is something like this at the uh, healthcare level. If somebody attacks a hospital system and basically says, we're not, we're not locking your, uh, your customer files. We're not locking your patient records, your medical records. We're just deleting them, okay? We're expunging them from the face of the earth. Good luck. If that happens, then there's going to be a lot more chaos, a lot more pandemonium. And I don't, unfortunately, I don't think we're as far away from that as we might think. 
I'd like to leave, believe that we're, we're a lot more secure than we were a few years ago, but it's certainly a cause for concern. So uh, on that happy note, uh, have a good weekend, and I'll see you all on Monday for data, data management, data governance.